said. Our Father, we thank you today. We bless your name for such a gathering like this. We're glorifying you, Lord, for our leadership development. And we pray, Lord, tonight you speak to every heart, every life in Jesus' name. Your work will prosper in our hearts. All the things that make us ineffective, you will take away completely in Jesus' name. Give us understanding in your word and give us insight into what you reveal today. Bless everyone without exception and make us channels of blessing to other people in our ministries. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We're coming to Nehemiah chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 17. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. Come. And let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for, the, for this good work. I told you last uh, week that I'm starting a new series. And each of the Tuesdays, by the grace of God, I'll take a whole book of the Bible. And then we'll run through and we'll learn leadership principles in that whole book. Today happens to be Nehemiah. And we're going to look at Nehemiah and see what God has preserved for us as we think, as we talk about leadership. If you know Nehemiah, Nehemiah was a master builder in the Old Testament. He was practical. He was proactive. He was prayerful. He was dynamic. He was courageous. He was single-minded. Just like Paul the Apostle in the New Testament. He possessed, that is, Nehemiah possessed the necessary leadership qualities which are essential for accomplishing a nearly impossible task. Think about what's what to perform him and what he had to do. Of course, you see that he was concerned about the wall of Jerusalem, a great concern that he had. Look at chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 3. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. That was a great concern for him. Come to chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 13, the wall. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well and the dung pot, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem. I viewed, I saw, I examined the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Look at chapter 3. In chapter 3 verse 27, it tells us in verse 27 after that, after them, the Tequoites repaired another piece over against the great tower that lies out even unto the wall of Ophel. You see the emphasis and you see the concentration on the wall of Jerusalem that Nehemiah believed that God raised him up 
that you will build. Look at chapter 4. In chapter 4, I'm reading here from verse 6. In verse 6, it says, So we build the wall. No diversion, no distraction, just the wall. We build the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the heart thereof, for the people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. They were single minded and they concentrated. This is the work. This is what we are called for, and we're going to do it. And they put their shoulders to the load, to the weight, because they had a mind to work. Chapter 5, I'm reading verse 16. Chapter 5, verse 16. Yea, also I continued in the work of this wall. I continued. I started. I continued until the consummation of the work. The work of this wall. Chapter 6 and verse 15. In verse 15, we're told, so the wall was finished. In the 20th and fifth day of the month Elul, in 50 and two days. And so you have seen the concentration is calling, is consecration. His concentration, his conviction, what he ought to do. But the question is, as we think about the wall, we say, what's the big deal about the wall? For the people of Israel, naturally. For the people of Judah, naturally. And for the people today, spiritually, the wall signifies for them seven things. Number one, there was possession because of the wall. When you have the wall and all the property, there's possession right there. That's what Ezra chapter 9 verse 9 tells us. Number two, there's a partition. The wall of partition that says, this is mine and that is for the Gentile. This is for the people of God, the chosen people of God, and that is for the uncircumcised. Number one, it granted them and grants us today possession. Number two, it grants partition. Now that you'll find in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14. Number three, power. When you have the wall, you have power. You have some authority over what you possess. That was Isaiah chapter 25, verses 3 and 4. What he tells us, number 4, is protection. Protection. I'm going to read this one in Zechariah chapter 2. Zechariah chapter 2, the wall is for protection. And there the Lord tells us in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For I, says the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. When you have a wall around your property and around yourself, you feel secured because, number one, you have the possession of that place. Number two, you have partition. Your partition did this is mine. Number three, you have power. And number four, you have protection. Number five, you have preservation. Preservation. In First Samuel chapter 25, they, did, they did told the people, we're being a wall of preservation concerning all the property of neighbor. And then number six is prestige. Prestige, Revelation chapter 21, verse 14, verse 18, verse 19, it grants us prestige. Number seven is praise. Praise is praiseworthy because of the world. That's why Nehemiah was so concentrated and so concerned about the world. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 60, and I'm reading from verse 18. Isaiah chapter 60, reading from verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land. Good, good, amen. amen. Wasting or destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. And so because of all this, number one, possession. Number two, partition. Number three, power. Number four, protection. Number five, preservation. 
Number six, prestige. Number seven, praise. That's why when Nehemiah heard that the walls were broken down and the gates were burnt with fire, he was so concerned, in fact, he wept. And then he thought upon the name of the Lord that God will do something. And he was willing that he will be used of God so that the walls of Jerusalem will be built. Today, as we think about the church, the church is in a desperate need of building the wall, the wall of salvation, that the salvation of the Lord will become like a wall for every individual and for every family and for the local church and for the church at large that that wall and work of salvation will be done in every heart number two the wall of separation that god will do something that a wall is built between the church and the world instead of the church becoming worldly and then the world becoming churchy there is a demarcation the wall of salvation and the wall of sanctification that we will know that this is a member of the body of christ and this is part of the church ecclesia a called out body a called out assembly that has the wall of sanctification the wall of spirituality that church people Christian people, citizens of the kingdom, will not be worldly. Christian people will not be people that are so empty and carnal, but we need to build the wall of spirituality, the wall of spiritual gifts. As you look at the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, you will see how the gifts of the Spirit separated and distinguished the people of God because of the power and then we need the wall of supernaturalness so that people will not look at us, push us, trample on us. They'll see the supernatural power of God in our lives and we will do exploits. And you will do exploits in Jesus' name. And the wall of unity. The, the church is scattered. And the church is divided. When one goes that way, the other one goes that other way. But the Lord is going to build. He'll use you and use me and use us together. As the Nehemiahs of today, we will build the wall in Jesus' name. Salvation, separation, sanctification, spirituality, spiritual gifts, supernaturalness, as well as unity. Today, we're looking at the making of a courageous, single-minded master builder. As we look at Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, we're looking at the making of a courageous, single-minded master builder. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the conviction and consecration of single-minded leaders, builders. The conviction and the consecration of single-minded builders that you'll find in Nehemiah chapters 1, 2, and 3. Point number 2. The commitment and courage of steadfast builders. The commitment and courage of steadfast builders. Nehemiah 4, 5, 6, and 7. Point number three, the consolidation and conservation by scriptural builders. The consolidation and conservation by scriptural builders. Chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. The consolidation and conservation of scriptural builders. Point number one, the conviction and consecration of single-minded builders. Let's come back to Nehemiah chapter one. In Nehemiah chapter one, you'll find out how Nehemiah heard and what made him to take on the project that he took on, the conviction and the consecration 
of single-minded hedge builders. I'm looking at Nehemiah chapter 1 from verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Akaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislew, in the twelfth year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, and Anani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked concerning the Jews that were escaped. I was interested, I took interest, I interrogated, I interviewed, and I asked about the Jews that escaped, which were led of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are led of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and in great reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. And it came to pass in verse 4, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept. He internalized the message, the breaking down of the wall and the burning of the gate. He said, I heard that and he did something in me. It broke me down. The broken walls broke his heart. Then he said, I sat down, I wept, I mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. If you have a burden in the heart, it will not take long until the people you serve and the people you company with, they will notice. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants. He wasn't the only person concerned. Other people too, thy servant Nehemiah and thy servants, others, who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, that's me, that's Nehemiah, this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. I was talking about the king of the land that he served, for I was the king's cupbearer. Come to chapter 2. In chapter 2, you begin to see his concern when the king now gave him opportunity that he will go out and go forth and do something about the wall that was broken down. Chapter 2, verse 1, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine, it was a cup bearer, and gave each unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad? Seeing thou art not sick, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was so afraid. Then said, then said, and said unto the king, Let not let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lies waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I preach to the God of heaven. You are following the flow of the story. It was sad. It was sorrowful. His heart was broken because of the spiritual condition of the people and because of the physical condition of the people too. And that sorrow appeared in his, on his countenance. And the king asked him, what's the matter? What's happening to you? And then he said, I'm sad for one thing. I'm well placed here. I have a job here, I have a lucrative job, I have money, everything is all right, but the city of the people of God 
and the city, the siege of the God of Israel, broken down, and the walls have broken down. That's why I'm sad. And the king said, what are you asking for? What's your request? What do you want? He said he was afraid, but he prayed. And then the king eventually gave him chance, and he went to Jerusalem. If you have a body for the people of God, if you have a body for the glory of God, the Lord will open the door for you. You will reach out to the people and many will come into the kingdom and the glory of God will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. When he got there, what did he do? Look at verse 17. Let me back up to verse 12. I need to show you something here. Look at chapter 2, verse 12. And I arose in the night and I and some few men with me Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save except the beast that I rode. Look at this, verse 13. And I went out by night. Underline that. I went, I went, I went. Look at verse 14. Then I went. Then I wait. Look at verse 15. Then I wait. A person that says he has a vision is not on the move. It's not on the go. It's, ten, it's standing. It's staying static in one place. You will not achieve or accomplish anything. But he said, then I wait. Then I wait. Then I wait. And then verse 17. Then said I unto them. You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. He said, let us rise up and build. They responded, let us rise up and build. They were united in their vision. They were united in the commission. They were united in the dedication to do the work. They were united in their consecration. He said, let us rise up and build. And they responded, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. They didn't weaken each other. They didn't attack each other. They didn't slander each other. They didn't pull down each other. They lifted up each other's hands and they strengthened each other for this good work. Chapter 3, verse 1. In chapter 3, verse 1, then Elashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest, and they built the sheep gate. Everyone got involved. The high priest, the priest, and all the other priests or their brethren, they join in in the work, in the assignment before the church, building the wall of the kingdom of God, building the wall of salvation, and building the wall of service unto the Lord, building the wall of soul winning, and building the wall of commitment to the work of God. Everybody will be involved. You will be involved. I will be involved. And it is only in that way that we don't have clergy and lady and say the work is in their hand. They are paid to do that. Or maybe the clergy would say those other younger people, the lady, they are still strong. They will do it when everybody rises up. 
when everybody addresses the issue of the day and everybody says i'm going to put in every sin there is in my heart in my hand in my background in my training and we're going to do it the work will be done you will not be missing there look at verse 5 of chapter 3 chapter 3 verse 5 it says in verse 5 and next unto them the Tequites repaired, but their nobles put not their neck to the work of their Lord. If you shirk your duty, if you dodge responsibility, the record will be in the book of God in heaven. You will not run away from a challenge in Jesus' name. Nothing of eternal value nothing of eternal significance can be done in christ's kingdom without conviction and without consecration as we have seen the passages we have read nehemiah's heart was deeply stirred when he heard and when he saw the deplorable condition of god's people and so he prayed and so he pursued and so he prepared himself and so he gave himself unreservedly to the work the Lord had called him to. In his prayer and in his consecration, we find that he was fully surrendered unto God. Totally, completely, without reservation, surrendered unto the Lord. Many people sometimes they are asking, when you talk about conviction, when you talk about consecration, what does that really mean? How can I see in practical terms what the conviction is all about? How can I see in practical terms what the consecration is all about? Number one, Nehemiah did not count any price too high to pay. No price too high to pay. He said, I'm ready. I'll give up anything. I'll deny myself of anything so that this work will be done. No price too high to pay. Number two, no path too rough to traverse. I was going to go from where he was, I was going to go to Jerusalem. The road was rough. Things were not certain. And the security on the road, he couldn't be definite about that. But he said, here is conviction. Here is something I believe the Lord has called me to do. And because of that, there was no path to rob, to traverse. Number three, no pain too severe to endure. The pain of the road and the pain of of the sorrow and the suffering he was going to meet there on the field he said this is what i'm talking about i have conviction this is what i'm talking about i am completely sold to this enterprise no pain too severe to endure number four no persecution too grievous to bear to buy a rusov sambalat rusov Opposers rose up, adversaries rose up, slanderers rose up, false people rose up. He said, I can take that. I can take everything. The fire that burns on the inside is greater than the fire that burns on the outside because he counted no persecution too grievous to bear. That's why he did what he did. Number five, no position too lucrative to give up. You know, he was settled in a great work where he was, but he said, never mind, I'll give up anything. And when you think about the salvation of souls today, and you think about the people who are perishing, and you think about the people who are to go out and rescue the perishing, no position will be too lucrative to give up. Number, number six, no pleasure too dear to forsake. No pleasure too dear to forsake. This is what hinders people. I enjoy the comfort of this place. I enjoy the pleasure in this uh, place. 
I enjoy all the things that are provided in this place. And I'm thinking about it now. If I go there to Jerusalem, an abandoned place, a place that had not been taken care of for a long time, what am I going to have? Consecration means there is no pleasure to dare to forsake. Number seven, no prestige too precious to sacrifice. Think about the prestige of Nehemiah. He was in the court of the king. And all the people that came from other nations to see that king, they would see Nehemiah. He was the one serving them. If they wanted some favor from the king, they'll go through Nehemiah. But he said, all that I can abandon. All that I can give up. No prestige. Too precious to sacrifice. This is the urgent need of the hour. And I've released all things in his search. That's why God equipped him. When you come to that situation and you take your conviction serious and you take your consecration serious and you go through all this and heaven can attest to it that this is your mind and this is your heart, God will use you wonderfully in Jesus' name. I say, chapter 61 i'm reading from verse 11 isaiah chapter 61 and we're looking at verse 11 in verse 11 of isaiah chapter 61 first the earth bringeth forth a bird and the garden as the garden causes the seeds that are sown in need to spring forth so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Amen. Chapter 62, verses 6 and 7. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, Keep not silence and give him no rest. Pray and keep on praying. Search and keep on seeking. Give him no rest till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The church in our land, the church in our nation, the church in our continent will rise up and shine again. Look at Psalm 132, Psalm 132, I'm reading from verse 4, 132 of the Psalms, verses 4 and 5, I will not give sleep to mine eyes, nor slumber to mine eyelids, until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. That's consecration. That's commitment. That's conviction. I'm not going to rest. I'm not going to take my ease. I'm not going to sleep until the name of the Lord is known and until the church becomes a glorious church, not having spot, not having wrinkle, and they will prepare the church for the coming of the Lord. You'll be part of it. We'll all be part of this in Jesus' name. Point number two now, the commitment and courage of steadfast builders. The commitment and courage of steadfast builders. We're coming back to Nehemiah, and I'm reading from chapter 4, verse 1. Nehemiah, chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 1. Look at this, it says, and it came to pass, that when Sambalat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth, and it took great indignation, and he mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren the, and the army of, of Samaria, and said, What do these Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the caves of the rubbish which are burnt? 
Verse 3. Now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was by him. And he said, Even that which they build, if the folks go up, he shall even break down the stone wall. Sometimes there are people that cannot live with slander, with persecution, with name calling, with insult, with assault. They cannot live with ridicule. But you see, Nehemiah was ridicule. It was to divert his attention from what he was called to do. Nothing will break your commitment. Nothing will destroy what you have set your mind upon. You will do it. It will be done in Jesus' name. And look at uh, verse 4 here. Here, O oh our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity and cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders verse 6 so build we the wall they may just so build we the wall. They ridicule so build we the wall. They belittled the work we were doing so build we the wall. They kind of put us down as if we can never come up and we can never do good and the stone wall can never be broken. It says so we built the wall. It was like there's confusion. It was like degradation. Everything was on the downward trend. So we built the wall. You know what the Ima is telling you and telling me? Whatever they do, whatever they say, however they talk, and whatever insult or assault, we're going to also say so we built the wall. Can you say that? Say that again. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, and the people, for the people had a mind to walk. The people have a mind to walk. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, and I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people be not afraid of them fear paralysis be not afraid of them fear will make you to even forget where you are going and the vision you said you possess be not afraid of them remember the lord remember the lord whenever you remember the lord his strength, his power, his calling, his ability, you'll not fear because you know he that is with us is greater than he that is in the world. A good, good amen. amen. He said, remember the Lord which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, for your sons and for your daughters and for your wives and for your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard, when they heard it, that it was known unto us. And God had brought their counsel to naught. God will bring their counsel to naught. All the adversaries, God will bring their counsel to naught. All the opposers, God will bring their counsel to naught. That will return all of us to the wall, everyone unto his work. Are you there? Everyone unto his work. Everyone unto his work. I will stay at my post. I will stand at my post. I will minister at my post. Nothing will shake you out of your post in Jesus' name. And then we come to chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 3. In chapter 5, verse 3, some also that there were said, we 
some also there were that said, we have mortgaged our land, our vineyards, our houses, that we might buy corn and be, because of the deer. There are some other people that came to oppress the people of the land. And these people were Israelites themselves. And so Nehemiah confronted them, verse 8, and I said unto them, We, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren? He was bold, he was courageous. Whatever was wrong, he was ready to put everything right, like you are going to do. Chapter 6. Verse 1, now it came to pass when Shambalat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall. They were here. I said they will hear that your hands are on the plow. They will hear that to address your strength, everything you've got to the work of the Lord. If you are succeeding, it, it will not be kept in the secret. They will hear that you are succeeding. Amen. Your success, your progress in the ministry, in the work of God will be known to all men beyond you in Jesus' name. Amen. And that there was no breach left therein, though at that time, I had not set up the doors even upon the gates that Sambalach and Geshem said unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono that but the thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work. Are you doing a great work? Yes. Preaching the gospel. I am doing a great work. Helping people to be converted out of sin to the Savior. I am doing a great work. Discipling the converts and making them to know the word of the Lord, the way of the Lord, and the will of God. I am doing a great work. Counseling teaching, preaching, helping people to grow in the faith. I am doing a great work, evangelizing, having crusades, and healing the sick, and delivering the oppressed. I am doing a great work. Your time will be precious to you. Your time will be precious to God. He sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down unto you? Yet in verse 4, they sent unto me four times after they sought. And I answered them after the same manner. And then they changed their tactics. But he continued. Why? A man of courage, a man that had commitment. Look at chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. And my God put into my heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. He says, I found the register. I wanted to make sure everybody that should be in is in. And you'll make sure everybody in your community that ought to come into the kingdom through you, they'll come in in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you understand, all this that Nehemiah did, he was courageous. Courage. Whatever knowledge you have, without courage, that knowledge will not be useful to anybody. Whatever training you have, 
That training will not be useful if you don't have courage. Whatever concern you have, I'm concerned, I have compassion. If you don't have courage, you'll not even come out of the door of your house. Whatever vision you have, without courage, whatever plans and whatever proposals, without courage, all will remain in the cold room of your lethargic heart. And when the meat is in the cold room, it's in the fridge, you cannot just bring it out and eat it, you must set it on fire. And it is courage that says what you got, your knowledge, your training, your concern, your compassion, your vision, your plans, your proposals, and your opportunities, it is courage that sets everything on fire. Because he was courageous, he did what he did. Cowards will never amount to anything in the kingdom of God. You'll not be a coward. I will not be a coward. You're talking like cowards. You'll not be a coward in Jesus' name. The heavenly vision needs a steady level of courage. If the good work will continue until a profitable ending. Nehemiah was a man, was not a man. Enemies could crush. You know, there are people, easy to crush them. Like the, like the, like the worm, like the, the millipede. They're like the ants on the ground. Even they themselves, they feel like grasshoppers. It's very easy for people. Already they know that you can crush the man. It's a coward. You can crush that lady. She's a coward. But a person that has the heart of a conqueror and the mind of an achiever, nothing will crush you. Nehemiah was not a man. Enemies could easily crush with opposition with slander, with false prophecy, with threats, with diversionary acts or tactics, with persecution, with direct or indirect attacks. He had the courage and the mindset of a conqueror. That's what you need today, the courage and the mindset of a conqueror. What do you need today? The courage and the mindset of a conqueror. I said, what do you need today? Resolute and relentless, he walked with the courage, number one, of his seer. He could see. He could see the future. I see the walls all built. I see the glory coming back. I see the strength of the people of God. And because of what he saw, he was a man of courage, the courage of his seer. Number two, the courage of his soldier. The courage of his soldier. He has prepared his mind. The God of heaven is going with me. I'm going to the battlefield and I'm going to earnestly contend for the broken walls of Jerusalem. Those walls are going to be built. And when you go forth with the courage of a seer, the courage of a soldier, you're honestly content for the faith was delivered unto the saints in Jesus' name. He went out with the courage of a standard bearer. The courage of a standard bearer. He looked at all of Jerusalem. And he could not see anybody lifting up the standard. And he said, Lord, I volunteer. Lord, I give myself. Lord, I am available. You'll be available. Lord, I will be faithful. You'll be faithful in Jesus' name. He went forth with the courage of his standard bearer. Number four, he went out with the courage of his single-minded seeker. He was seeking the glory of God. He was seeking the, the, the strength of Israel. He was seeking the dignity of the people of God, single-minded seeker. Here is what I'm looking for. Here is what I'm going to have until I see this in the land. I will not trust the courage of a single-minded seeker. He went forth with the courage of a shepherd. 
David said, I was tending, taking care of the sheep of my father. And a lion came, also a coward. I rushed at that lion, held him by the beard, tore him to pieces with my bare hands. A bear came. You have to be courageous to do this. That you're not allowed the least of the sheep of God, the least of the people of God to be devastated, to be destroyed, and then to perish. It says, I took that bear, I killed him. And it says that God who was with me, and I killed the lion, and I killed the bear, that same God will be with you. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. The courage of a shepherd. Number six, the courage of a strategist. He was a strategist. Before he got there, he had visualized, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'll meet this, I'll meet that. This is how I deal with that. I will see all the broken walls. I'll see the gates that are burnt up. This is how I'm going to raise that up. I'm going to see the nobles that are lethargic, the nobles that are dull of hearing, the nobles that will not put their shoulders to the, to the wall. Here is going, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it this way. Here is the administration. Here is the division of labor. Here is what I will do. He was a strategist. And he went there with the courage of a strategist. And that's what we need, the courage of a seer, the courage of a soldier, the courage of a standard bearer, the courage of a single-minded seeker, the courage of a shepherd, the courage of a strategist, the courage, number seven, of a sustainer. The courage of a sustainer. He sustains the work. There are some people, they cannot sustain their energy. Yesterday, they were strong and they ran fast. Today, they have slowed down. They are not sustainers. Yesterday, they had a bright vision. And they were saying, let us rise up and build. Let us go. We're going to take the land. That was yesterday. Today now, they look warm and they're lethargic. You cannot depend upon them today. But you know Nehemiah, from beginning to the end, he was sustained in his vision. God will sustain you. The grace of God will sustain you. The power of the Spirit will sustain you in Jesus' name. He had seen the invisible, so he became invincible. He had seen the invisible, and so he became invincible. When looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, I'm reading here from verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And when you see the invisible, his might, his strength, his power, his glory, and his exaltation, when you see the invisible, you become invincible you'll have courage joshua chapter one i'm reading from verse five joshua chapter one we're reading from verse five courage there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life that promise is mine i said that promise is mine at your age now, no man shall be able to stand before you. In a few years' time, when you grow older, no man shall be able to stand before you. When you go into the midst of those Canaanites, no man shall be able to stand before you. On the hill, in the valley, beside the waters, in the city, in the village, anywhere you go, 
there shall no man be able to stand before you all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee to not from me to the right hand or to the left hand that thou mayest prosper somebody there will prosper that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein but then thou shalt make thy way prosperous amen and then thou shalt have good success verse 9 have not i commanded thee be strong and of a good courage if you don't have courage while you are very near the victory line you'll turn back as if there's no way there's a way open before you be not afraid neither be thou dismayed for the lord thy god is with thee whithersoever thou goest and somebody said second yeah. timothy second timothy chapter two second timothy chapter two i'm reading from verse three thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of jesus christ endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worries entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Your work will please the Lord. Your ministry will please the Lord. And all your endeavors will please the Lord in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now the consolidation and conservation by scriptural builders consolidation and conservation by scriptural builders nehemiah chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 1 and all the people gather themselves together as one man no stranger as one man no division as one man no arguments as one man no diversions as one man no other thought and no other intention they all gathered as one man into the street that was before the water gate and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book bring the book they all agreed together they said there's no other thing to think about no other thing to discuss and no other things to deliberate on bring the book look at verse 2 and Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month when he brought the book look at verse 8 so they read in the book of the law of god distinctly and gave the sense interpreted it and caused them to understand the reading they caused them to understand the reading 
And when they heard, look at the latter part of verse 9, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. It brought conviction to them. They saw they were transgressors. They saw they had gone out of the way. And with sorrow of heart, and with contrition, they now called upon the Lord. They wept when they heard the words of the law. And then in the latter part of verse 10, it says, This day is, a, is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry, you'll be sorrowful for your sin. Believe the Lord now. It's a merciful God. It's a forgiving God. It's a pardoning God. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. And then he taught them more and more. And they obeyed the word of God. And they did that with gladness. Verse 17, verse 18. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made boots. And they sat down under the boots. For since the days of Joshua, Joshua the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so. It was a new thing. It was a great thing. A great revival across the across boards for the word of God. And there was great gladness. Also day by day. From the first day unto the last day. He read in the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days. And, all, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner thereof. Look at chapter 9. Chapter 9, I read from verse 1. Now, in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And they obeyed the watch of God. And they stood and they confessed their sins and the iniquity of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth of the day. And another false patch they confess and they worship the Lord their God. You can see the total commitment as they consolidated their faith in the Lord. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, and because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it and our princes and Levites and priests sealed it. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now those that sealed were Nehemiah and the rest of them. And then in chapter 10, verse 28. Chapter 10, verse 28. And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the naked names, and all day that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God. They separated themselves from the pollutions of the land, corruption of the land, and they separated themselves unto the law of God. Their wives too, and their sons, and their daughters, everyone having knowledge, having understanding. They cleave to their brethren. They united together. They were so neat together, standing on the word of God, which cannot be destroyed. They were standing on that word, and the Lord blessed them. The Lord will bless you. Amen. Chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. And the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city. 
and nine parts to dwell in other cities because uh, the, the Jerusalem was large the people who were there, they were not enough to fill the place. And so they said, what are we going to do? And then somebody suggested one out of ten in every location, in every community. They searched all the community and they went and surveyed everywhere. One out of ten, one out of ten, one out of ten, one out of ten, one out of ten. And they all came to Jerusalem. The unity was so much among them. It will happen again. I said, it will happen again. Chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. Now these are the priests and the levers that went up with Zerubbabel. They took records and they saw the people that went. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, and at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their places to bring them to jerusalem and you know the beauty of each come nobody said no come nobody gave excuse come nobody said i have another more important thing come and nobody said no not at this time i'm thinking of another time the moment they pointed at them you are to be there you are to be there you are to be there everybody agreed what unity that unity will continue in our midst in jesus name when we hear the word of god you will not give excuse amen when it comes to your turn this is what you do you will not say no in jesus name it says to bring them to jerusalem to keep the dedication and with gladness with thanksgiving with singing and with symbols and with subtries and with halves and the sons of the singers gather themselves together both out of the plain country round about jerusalem and from the villages it went on like that now chapter 13 in chapter 13 i'm reading here from verse 7 chapter 13 verse 7 and i came to jerusalem and understood of the evil that Elashib did for Tobiah in preparing a chamber in the court of the house of God. And it grieved me so. Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, you see, this was a real leader. His knees were not weak in prayer. His feet were not weak in preaching. His mouth was not weak in declaring the might of God. His heart was not weak in standing, standing for the truth. That's the kind of leader God needs today. And you will be in Jesus' name. Then I commanded. I didn't suggest, I commanded. I didn't give an opinion, I commanded. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers. See that, and see that brought I again the vessels of the house of God, and with meat offering, and the frankincense. And I perceived that the portion of the Levites had not been given to them, and so he regularized that again. Look at verse 11. Then contended I with the rulers. Contended I with the rulers. There are some of the rulers, some of the leaders, they were not acting right. They were not obeying the word of God. He didn't say, the rulers, I don't want trouble. I don't want any division. I don't want any routing. I don't want mutiny. So I'm going to keep quiet. He said, no, I contended with the rulers and said why is the house of god forsaken and i gathered them together and set them in their place god will give you that kind of courage and that kind of commitment and you will do what needs to be done in jesus name look at verse 17 in verse 17 then I contended with the nobles of Judah. 
Look at this man. He didn't say that somebody was untouchable because of their position. Somebody, you cannot teach them the word of God because of the way they are comporting themselves. He said, no, even the nobles, I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, what evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath? Come to verse 25. Verse 25, and I contended with them. Look at that. I contended with them. I pray the spirit of the conqueror will be in your heart in Jesus' name. Nobody will be committing sin with impurity in your sight. And then you're so afraid you cannot talk. That fear God drive away from every heart in Jesus' name. Look at verse 26. Did not Solomon, king of Judah, sin by these things? Yet among many nations, was there no king like him who was the Lord of his God? And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him, wise Solomon, even him, rich Solomon, even him, popular Solomon, even him, well-known preacher, did outlandish women cause to sin. Outlandish women will not cause you to sin. Tempters will not cause you to sin. Temptresses will not cause you to sin. Money, love of money will not cause you to sin. Verse 27, shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? God forbid. I said, God forbid. The Lord will make us stand in Jesus' name. You have seen what Nehemiah did. He's come and gone. Now it's my turn. Now it's my turn. We're going to raise the foundation again. We're going to build the foundation again. Psalm 11 verse 3. Psalm 11 verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let's examine the foundation. The foundation of faith. The foundation of the church, the foundation of the ministry, the foundation of our calling. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Isaiah chapter 58, I'm reading from verse 12. Isaiah chapter 58, reading from verse 12. And they that be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. What God is going to raise up to do in the church at large, in the body of Christ, in this stage, in this nation, in this continent, will go to many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. First Corinthians chapter 3. In First Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 3, reading here from verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builders thereon. But let every man take heed how he builders thereupon. For the foundation can no man lay, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You'll be a builder in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, tell me, depart from iniquity. Verse 21. 
if a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Are you ready? Nehemiah and all those connected with him were totally committed to God's word. No compromiser among them, no corrupter among them, no contaminants among them, and no contradictors among them, no conformists, those who are conformed to the world among them, no complainers among them. It's too much. The speech is too high. The body is too much. The load is too heavy. No, not at all. No, com no complainers among them. No conspirators among his associates. There was no Achan there. You'll not be an Achan. There was no Abihu that will bring in strange fire. You'll not be an Abihu to bring in strange fire. There was no Absalom there. There was no Ahithophel there. There was no Adonijah there. There was no Ataliah there. There was no Ananias there. There was no apostate there within his team. By the word of God, which had a free course among them, the work was consolidated and the spiritual benefits were conserved. Today, God is looking for a man, a woman like Nehemiah. Anyone there? I said anyone there? You'll be a Nehemiah, single-minded leader. A Nehemiah, a focused restorer. A Nehemiah, a tireless reformer. In Nehemiah, an earnest defender of the faith was delivered unto the saints. In Nehemiah, a relentless preacher of holiness. In Nehemiah, a purposeful fighter. In Nehemiah, a persevering champion. If you will be, step out and let the Lord see you. Stand up and tell the Lord, I will be. I will be. I will be. I will not allow anything to drive me back. No fear. No discouragement. No distraction. Lord, I am ready. Let the hand of God be upon you and be in Nehemiah today.